Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the North Chapel, and our thanks to the Unitarian Society of Woodstock for once again offering a beautiful home for the poetry programs of Bookstock. My name is Jim Schley, and the longtime poetry host, Partridge Boswell, and co-founder of Bookstock, had an opportunity to go to Ireland for the summer. So I'm pinch-hitting with the introductions. Happy to do this. And so I have a couple of little businessy things to say. Please silence cell phones, any device that's going to create an untoward noise. Restrooms, there's one straight through that door, another one just inside this door, and two more downstairs. And we're hoping to have no food within the sanctuary. That was the request from the church. The water is fine, of course. There are sponsors listed in your program. I have to look before I say this. Yes, the bucket is there. And if you know proprietors of businesses who have been supportive of this festival, because as you've noticed, everything is free this weekend, please thank them. And we gladly accept donations into the sap bucket, which will be turned into syrup. And not a, not a penny will be wasted. We also have a sign-up sheet for if you'd like to be kept apprised of Bookstock Adventures to Come. It's on the music stand right here in the front. Now it's with great pleasure I'm going to introduce Ocean Vuong. Born in Saigon, Vietnam, poet Ocean Wong was raised in Hartford, Connecticut, and earned a BA at Brooklyn College. In 2013 interview with Edward J. Rathke, Wong discussed the relationship between form and content in his work, noting, besides being a vehicle for the poem's movement, I see form as an extension of the poem's content, a space where tensions can be investigated even further. The way the poem moves through space, its enjambment or end-stopped line breaks, its utterances and stutters all work in tangent with the poem's conceit. Acknowledging the ever-increasing number of possible directions each new turn in a poem creates, Vuong continued, I think the strongest poems allow themselves to collapse completely before even suggesting resurrection or closure, and a manipulation of form can add another dimension to that collapse. Those of you who were here for the preceding session with Jody Gladding, you'll remember that she was re very much exploring the, the life of the poem on the page and the way it can spring off the page. Ocean Vuong is the author of the poetry collection Night Sky with Exit Wounds, 2016, which was awarded the 2018 T.S. Eliot Prize and the chapbooks No, 2013, and Burnings, 2010 which was an over-the-rainbow selection for the American Library Association. While Ocean has earned immediate and widening acclaim for his poetry, today he'll be reading to us from his newest book, the novel On Earth Were Brief Briefly Gorgeous, which shares its title with one of the poems in Night Sky with Exit Wounds. Another kinship between the poems and this miraculous writing in the new book are passages of, of the most intense alertness a strobe-like, prayer-like, revealing of new resources in the English language. I saw a friend last evening who took me by the shoulders and said, this is the most extraordinary book I've read in years. And I share her sense of this. Ocean Vuong currently lives in the Pioneer Valley of Massachusetts, where he's on the faculty of the MFA program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Please welcome Ocean Vuong. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much Jim, for that lovely introduction. Um, thank you everyone for being here and, and for uh, choosing uh, to give your attention and your presence um, to this festival and to literature and, uh, and, and thereby supporting a literary uh, and culturally informed community here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and um, I'll go right into it and then, and then we can perhaps have a a brief conversation. Um, I'll read two sections from the book. Could you move a little bit a little closer? 
Yeah. Yeah. How's that? Is that better? That's good. I get louder as I get braver. <laughs> Is this good? It's good. All right. Um, I'll read two sections from the book. Um, the, the first is more of a straight narrative. Um, when I started to write a novel, I knew I didn't want to use uh, tools that were familiar to me as a poet, which is the first person narrative. Um, and so in, in, in these two cases, you'll see a very straightforward narration. And in the second part, you'll see a more elliptical, fragmented, poetry-like form. This book is, a, in large part, a letter that the protagonist writes to his mother, who is illiterate. And a lot of that engagement attempts to cast the elders, in this case the mother and the grandmother, who raise him, who brings him life. I always felt that the I can be served as a searchlight for the writer. Often the I can easily be fallen into the pitfall of me, myself, and I. But we can also turn the I, the first person narration, into a searchlight that illuminates the protagonist's milieu and to orchestrate where they come from in the same way Ishmael did to Ahab, Nick Carraway for Gatsby, and Junior for Oscar Wilde. I'm dragged into a hole, darker than the night around it, by two women. Only when one of them screams do I know who I am. I see their heads, black hair matted from the floor they sleep on, the air sharp with a chemical delirium as they jostle in the blur of the car's interior. Eyes still thick with sleep, I make out the shapes, a headrest a felt monkey the size of a thumb swinging from the rear view, a piece of metal shining, then gone. The car peels out of the driveway, and I can tell from the smell of acetone and nail polish that it's your tan and rust Toyota. You and Grandma Lan are in the front, clamoring for something that won't show itself. The street lights fling by, hitting your faces with the force of blows. He's going to kill her, Mom. He's going to do it this time, you say, breathless. We riding, we riding helicopter fast, Lan says. She's in her own mind, red and dense with obsession. We riding where? She clutches the flip down mirror with both hands. I can tell by her voice that she's smiling, or at least gritting her teeth. He's going to kill my sister, Mama, you say. You sound like you're flailing down a river. I know, Carl. It's for real this time. You hear me, Ma? Lon rocks side to side from the mirror, making whooshing sounds. We getting out of here, huh? We gotta go far, little dog. Outside, the night surges by like sideways gravity. The green numbers on the dash read 3.04 a.m. Who put my hands in my face? The tires squeal at each turn. The streets are empty, and it feels like a universe in here, in everything hurling through the cosmic dark, while in the front seat the women who raise me are losing their minds. Through my fingers the night is black construction paper. Only the frazzled heads of these two before me are clear, swaying. Don't worry, my, you're speaking to yourself now. Your face so close to the windshield, the glass fogs a ring that spreads in equal measure to your words. I'm coming. We're coming. After a while, we swerve down a street lined with continentals. The car crawls, then stops in front of a gray, clobbered townhouse. My, you say, pulling the emergency brake. He's going to kill mine. Lan, who all this time had been shaking her head, stops as if the words have finally touched a little button inside her. What? Who killed who? Who died this time? Both of you stay in the car, you say. 
You unbuckle your seatbelt, leap out and shuffle toward the house, the door left open behind you. There's a story Lon would tell me of Lady Chiu, the mythical woman warrior who led an army of men and repelled the Chinese invasion of ancient Vietnam. I think of her seeing you. How, as legend goes, armed with two swords, she'd fling her yard-long breasts over her shoulders and cut down the invaders by the dozens. How it was always a woman who saved us. Who die now? Lan swings around. Her face, made stark by the overhead light, ripples with this new knowledge. Who gonna die, little dog? She flips her hand back and forth, as if opening a locked door to indicate emptiness. Somebody kill you? For what? But I'm not listening. I'm rolling down the window, arms burning with each turn, cool November air. My stomach grabs as I watch you mount the front steps, the nine-inch machete glinting in your hand. You knock on the door, shouting, Come out, Carl, you say in Vietnamese. Come out, you fucker. I'm taking her home for good. You can have the car. Just give me my sister. At the word sister, your voice cracks into a short sob. Before regaining control, you bash the door with the machete's wooden butt. The porch lights turn on. Your pink nightgown suddenly green under the fluorescent. The door opens. You step back. A man appears. He half lunges from the doorway as you backpedal down the steps, the blade locked at your side as if pinned in place. He has a gun, Lan whisper shouts from the car. Now lucid. Rose, it's a shotgun. It shoots two eaters at once. They eat your lungs inside out. Little dog, tell her. Your hands float over your head. The metal clanks on the driveway, the man, huge, his shoulders sloped under a gray Yankee sweatshirt, steps up to you, says a few words through his teeth, then kicks the machete to the side. It disappears in the grass with a flash. You mumble something, make yourself small, cup your hands under your chin, the posture you take after receiving a tip at the salon. The man lowers his gun as you back away, shaking toward the car. It's not worth it, Rose, Lan says, cupping her mouth. You can't beat a gun. You just can't. Come back. Come back in the helicopter. Ma, I hear myself say. Ma, come on. You edge slowly into the driver's seat. Turn to me with a nauseated stare. There's a long silence. I think you're about to laugh, but then your eyes fill, so I turn away. To the man carefully watching us, hand on his hip, the gun clamped between his armpit, pointed at the ground. When you start to talk, your voice is scraped out. I catch only parts of it. It's not my house, you explain, fumbling with your keys. Or rather, Mai is no longer there. The boyfriend, Carl, who used to slam her head against the wall, is no longer there. This is somebody else, white man with a shotgun and a bald head. It was a mistake, you're saying to Lan, an accident. But Mai has not lived here for five years, Lan says with sudden tenderness. Oh, Rose. Although I don't see it, I can tell she's brushing your hair behind your ear, the way a mother does. My move to Florida, remember? To open her own salon. Lan is poised, her shoulders relaxed. Someone else has stepped inside her and started moving her limbs, her lips. We go home now. You need sleep. Rose. The engine starts. The car lurches into a U-turn. As we pull away from the porch, a boy, no older than I am, points a toy pistol at us. The gun jumps 
and his mouth makes blasting noises. His father turns to yell at him. He shoots once, two more times. From the window of my helicopter, I look at him. I look him dead in the eyes and do what you do. I refuse to die. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this next part is uh, essentially uh, we, when we, the introducer talked about and um, quoted the moment where I said the best poems collapse. Um, and I do feel that way. And in this novel, I knew that at one point the prose, the floor of the novel, had to disintegrate for me. That was one of my ambitions in writing it. And perhaps it's my Trojan horse um, to get folks to read poetry. And that uh, two-thirds of the way through this novel, um, it disintegrates into poetry, and then it picks itself back up again. And I think uh, that disintegration might be fraught for uh, a traditional novelist. But for me, I, I, I knew that when the paragraph starts to fall apart, the ground of poetry will still be there to hold it in place because poetry is a form that breaks itself towards unity. And uh, I wanted to write about American life in a way that honored its fractures as a way forward. Um, and in this uh, moment, this is a sort of portrait of, uh, of a young uh, friend of Little Dogs, this protagonist that he meets while working on the tobacco farms uh, on the Connecticut River Valley. You'll, if you drive up I-91, you'll still see the tobacco sheds. Um, so he works on this farm and he meets this boy named Trevor. And uh, this is essentially a meditation on masculinity and um, you know, what happens when a boy tries to break out of hegemonic masculinity in America and the, the cost of that breach. Trevor, rusted pickup and no license. Trevor, 16, blue jeans streaked with deer blood. Trevor, too fast and not enough. Trevor, waving his John Deere cap from the driveway as you ride by on your squeaky swing. Trevor, who fingered a freshman girl, then tossed her underwear in the lake for fun, for summer. For your hands were wet and Trevor's a name like an engine starting up in the night who snuck out to meet a boy like you, yellow and barely there, Trevor going fifty through his daddy's wheat field, who jams all the fries into a whopper and chews with both feet on the gas, your eyes closed riding shotgun, the wheat a yellow confetti, three freckles on his nose. Three periods to a boy sentence. Trevor Burger King over McDonald's cause the smell of the smoke on the beef makes it real. Trevor Bucktooth clicking on his inhaler as he sucked eyes shut. Trevor who says, I like sunflowers best, they go so high. Trevor with a scar like a comma on his neck. Syntax of what next, what next, what next. Imagine going so high, he says, and still opening that big. Trevor loading the shotgun two red shells at a time. It's kind of like being brave, he says. Like you got this big old head full of seeds and no arms to defend yourself. His hard, lean arms aimed in the rain. He touches the trigger's black tongue, and you swear you taste his finger in your mouth as it pulls. Trevor pointing at the one-winged sparrow thrashing in black dirt and takes it for something new, something smoldering like a word, like a Trevor who knocked on your window at three in the morning, who you thought was smiling until you saw the blade held over his mouth. I made this, I made this for you, he said. 
the knife suddenly in your hand. Trevor later on your steps in the gray dawn, his face in his arms. I don't wanna, he said. His panting, his shaking hair, the blue of it, the blur of it. Please tell me I am not, he said, through the sound of his knuckles as he popped them like the word but, 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 and you take a step back. Please tell me I am not, he said. I am not a faggot, am I? Am I? Are you? Trevor the Hunter. Trevor, the carnivore, the redneck, not a pansy, shotgunner, sharp shooter, not fruit or fairy, Trevor, meat eater, but not veal, never veal, he says, fuck that, never again, after his daddy told him the story when he was seven, at the table, veal roasted with rosemary, how they were made, how the difference between veal and beef is the children, the children, the veal are the children of cows, are calves. They are locked in boxes the size of themselves, a body box like a coffin, but alive like a home. The children, the veal, they stand very still because tenderness depends on how little the world touches you. To stay tender, the weight of your life cannot lean on your bones. We love eaten what's soft, his father said, looking into Trevor's eyes. Trevor, who would never eat a child. Trevor, the child with a scar on his neck like a comma, a comma you now put your mouth to. That violet hook holding two complete thoughts, two complete bodies without subjects, only verbs. When you say Trevor, you mean the action, the pine stuck thumb on the big lighter, the sound of his boots on the Chevy's sun-bleached hood, your Trevor, your brunette, but blonde dusted arms man pulling you into the truck. When you say Trevor, you mean you are the hunted, a hurt he can't refuse because that's something, baby, that's real. And you wanted to be real, to be swallowed by what drowns you, only to surface brimming at the mouth which is kissing, which is nothing if you forget. His tongue in your throat, Trevor speaks for you. He speaks and you darken, a flashlight going out in his hands so he knocks you in the head to keep the bright on. He turns you this way and that to find his path through the dark woods, the dark words which have limits like bodies, like the calf waiting in its coffin house. No window but a slot for oxygen, pink nose pressed to the autumn night inhaling the bleached stench of cut grass, the tar and gravel road, coarse sweetness of leaves in a bonfire, the minutes, the distance, the earthly manure of his mother, a field away, clover, sassafras, Douglas fir, Scottish myrtle, the boy, the motor oil, the body, it fills up and your thirst overflows what holds it, and your ruin. You thought it would nourish him, that he would feast on it and grow into a beast you could hide in, but every box will be opened in time, in language. The line broken like Trevor, who stared too long into your face, saying, where am I? Where am I? Because by then there was blood in your mouth. By then the truck was totaled into a dust oak, smoke from the wrinkled hood. Trevor, vodka breathed and skull thin, said, it feels good, said, don't go nowhere. As the sun slid into the trees, don't this feel good? As the windows reddened like someone seeing through shut eyes. Trevor, who texted you after two months of silence, writing, please, instead of PLZ. Trevor, who was running from home, his crazy old man who was getting the fuck out, soaked Levi's, who ran away to the park, because where else when you're 16? Who you found in the rain under the metal slide shaped like a hippopotamus, 
whose icy boots you took off and covered one by one, each dirt-cold toe with your mouth the way your mother used to do when you were young and shivering, because he was shivering your Trevor, your all-American beef but no veal, your John Deere, Jade Vane and his jaw, stilled lightning you trace with your teeth, because he tasted like the river, and maybe you were one wing away from sinking, because the calf waits in its cage so calmly to be viewed. Because you remembered, and memory is a second chance. Both of you lying beneath the slide, two commas with no words at last to keep you apart. You who crawled from the wreck of summer like sons leaving their mother's bodies. A calf in a box waiting, a box tighter than a womb, the rain coming down, its hammers on the meadow like an engine revving up, the night standing in violet air, a calf shuffling inside, hoofs soft as erasers, the bell on its neck ringing and ringing, the shadow of a man growing up to it, the man with his keys, the commas of doors, your head on Trevor's chest, the calf being led by a string, how it stops to inhale, nose pulsing with dizzying sassafras, Trevor asleep beside you, steady breaths, rain, warmth welling through his plaid shirt, like steam issuing from the calf's flanks as you listen to the bell across the star-flooded field, the sound shining like a knife, the sound buried deep in Trevor's chest, and you listen, that ringing, you listen like an animal learning how to speak. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any questions, just raise your hand and, and go ahead and shout as you can. Um, I had to set the group aside for a little bit after getting to that part about the monkey's brain being eaten. And so I would like to hear you speak about, you know, writing that, putting that in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, you know, Despite being multiple things, uh, writing through multiple intersections, queer, Asian American, New Englander, um, I'm also a vegan, and I think I wanted to write a book that, in that scene, it was a, a scene of binaries, right? There's a, a, a mother at a, at a, at a, a, a checkpoint holding a daughter, and the checkpoint is being held by American GIs. And so, it's a familiar scene in any war, a polarity between civilians and, uh, and soldiers. But I wanted to expand on the complication and to say, to, to juxtapose that scene with a scene of uh, this, this, this myth of eating monkey brains to have it as an aphrodisiac that happens in a lot of, um, of uh, Southeast Asia as a way to say this is not about one side or the other for me, that all sides are culpable, that this notion of cruelty in order to, to expand one's progeny is a masculinist and patriarchal flaw in thinking, and that I did not want to stand on one side of a war, because in war everyone loses. And that scene is a way to, to wrestle it out of the polemics, that we often hear about the Vietnam War. And to say that despite these men who do this for, for their future, right? the understanding is that they eat this animal for their, to, to have children, and their children are fed into the machine of war regardless. How futile and how silly. And I think I wanted to have those things sit side by side and garner tension as a way to say that there is no clean answers because within one side or the other, there are those who inflict pain on all sorts of life. And that it's an indictment of our species in that moment, rather than an indictment of one side or another. Yes. I, I love your concept of the eye as a searchlight and a human and I would love to hear more about that if the eye is a searchlight, what is it searching for? Mm -hmm. 
Great question. What is the best use to as the eye, as a searchlight? I can only speak for myself. I think there are multiple uses, and all of them useful. Um, I, 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 I grew up in New England, so I'm dropped into um, you know, the, the literature of this region, one of which is uh, Moby Dick. And I think what was interesting in Moby Dick as an autobiographical novel, it's rarely spoken as such, but it is. Melville lived that life. Um, and you can see a lot of the relics of his life up in Pittsfield, not too far away in Massachusetts. And I think what he was trying to do was to turn a New England milieu into something that is charged with the dignity of literature. Because in 1850, when he was writing Moby Dick, American literature was still subordinate to English British literature. Right? It was it, it didn't have a way to stake a claim into its importance within the English language. Hawthorne was the first, um, but even then he was not stubbornly local in the way Melville was. And I think what he was trying to do was to stake that the autobiographical novel, the historical eye within a New England milieu was worthy of literature, was worthy of the imagination. And he wanted to stake claim and illuminate uh, a group of folks, in this case a multiracial, complicated group of whalers, on the stage of, of the novel, right? the, the grand novel. And I think in the same way the autobiographical a novel has that potentiality for me as well. And we see this particularly for any writer, now particularly writers of color or, or even writers on the margins who are interested in claiming uh, a map of one's milieu. Right? And so for myself, I wanted to write about Hartford. I wanted to have these uh, contextual truths to be the site of this novel. I could have written sci-fi, put them on Mars, or put them in ancient Vietnam, and it would be the same story. But I wanted to say that as much as this is a coming-of-age novel, it's also a coming of art. Right? In German, that would be called the Kunstler-Roman. So it's both a Bildungs-Roman and a Kunstler-Roman. It's important for me as a writer of color because often when we enter the literary publishing world, um, the, 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 the publishing world fetishizes the self-arising independent phenomenon right, of the young writer of color. He comes out of nowhere. And, and, and further, that he transcends his milieu. He got out of poverty in order to make it at this table. But I wanted to say that it, he didn't get here in spite of his roots. He got here because of it. And one way an autobiographical novel uh, like uh, can do in the same sense that Melville did was to cast this crew of broken, smart, intelligent women who come out of war suffering from PTSD as sites of power. Same goes with Hartford, the Hartford that we rarely see, the Hartford of Franklin Avenue, the Hartford that came after Twain and Wallace Stevens and Harriet Beecher Stowe. And it was an opportunity, and we see this, Toni Morrison took the same opportunity in Bluest Eye, James Baldwin in Go Tell It to the Mountain, uh, and even Sylvia Plath in The Bell Trap. Right? It's no coincidence to me that Sylvia began her first novel, and only novel, as an autobiographical novel, because she had to stake a claim for a woman's intelligence in 1950s and 60s America when that was not even conceivable. Right? So she had to cast herself as a searchlight and say, despite this milieu, I came out of it, that I didn't arrive out of nowhere. And so I think this is why I was really interested in the autobiographical gaze, because I, it was at once a fictionalized attempt to create art, but also a map of where we've come from. Yes, over there. Um, I wish I had a thousand hours to just with you about everything. Um, but I will limit myself to one question, which is um, 
about chanting, it seems to me that although you're reading prose, you read it very much as poetry is very fully prose. Um, you, it, there's this absolutely um, mesmerizing feeling of chanting in your words and the way that you speak them. Um, is that something that you thought of all about it? Or? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think there are multiple influences there. Um, the most obvious might be that I'm a practicing Buddhist and I do chant um, in Vietnamese and in Tibetan. Um, that's part of my daily meditative practice. Um, but also as a, someone who came, who came out of the spoken word community um, and also the, the, the spoken word communities of my elders, uh, the, the spoken word tradition, the oral tradition, um, and also, uh, you know, I studied 19th century American literature, and so Whitman, right, the anaphora, and Whitman was influenced by uh, the transcendentalists of, of, of uh, New England, Thoreau and Emerson, and uh, the, the Hindu texts, but also Buddhism, um, but also the King James Bible, was all, which is also a chant, chant-like text. Um, and so I, I think, I, I, I think, you know, I haven't thought about it as analytically as I'm saying it now, but I think I would say that all those things are sort of, um, you know, enter me through osmosis, and it, it lives on the text that way. Yeah. And also Vietnamese rhythm. Vietnamese is an incredibly rhythmic uh, language, and I think that Vietnamese informs and improves my English, if that makes sense. Yes. <coughs> Um, and also you talk about the, the aggressive nature of um, just writing, writing. Um, do you think that it's just your nature to explore language that way, or do you really feel that um, being bilingual and often serving as an interpreter for your family influences you when studying language that way? Uh, absolutely. The latter. The latter. Um, be, you know, being bilingual, being an immigrant, being uh, the first in my family to speak English and therefore be their translator and interpreter. You know, you, as, as young as the age of six or seven, you know, you're hearing English in one ear and within the span of a few inches, you have to now translate, right, in Vietnamese. The Vietnamese has to come out. It has to come out better. It has to come out in ways that are more useful to your elders because it's a way of service and a way of survival, right? You, you, you can make them visible by translating the world to them and to translate them to the world. And so there's a lot at stake. And so you learn to edit, you learn to, to be concise, and you learn to privilege the luminous moment in a sentence through that practice. Um, so, so absolutely, I think, which is, I think that's why I wanted to set this book as a premise of a son writing to a mother who can't read. Because when a recipient is not promised, the pressure now falls on language. It now becomes an enactment of a very American crisis of language. I think we're always in a crisis of language in this country. Is the sentence enough as an architecture to hold our thinking and feeling and inquiry as a peoples? And what happens when it's misused? Right? And I think the violence in how we talk about success is indicative of the trajectory and the history of our country at once. Right? I'm killing it. I'm smashing them. Right? You went in there, guns blazing. Knock them dead. Right? And, and even the way we talk about sexual conquest. Right? You bagged her. You effed her brains out. Right? This is what I grew up with as an American boy. And we, we, it makes us wonder, why? What is it about our culture that the only way we can celebrate ourselves is through the lexicon of death? Where are we headed if that's us at our best? Right? And I think you don't have to be a writer or a professor to change usage. Language is the most democratic medium because you change it as soon as you start talking. You change on your own terms, and that's the only way language change. And when language change, our imaginations change. 
So right now, amongst queer communities, we're saying, that's giving me life, right? That dress is giving me life, right? Uh, I feel I'm, I'm living, I'm living for that show, I'm living for that novel, right? So we're already casting new ways to think, and I think it's important. Often we think the future is in our hands, but I actually think it's in our mouths. We have to speak the world we want to embody. And that's a powerful thing. Thank you so much. I think I'll end there. <laughs> uh, good to know you, and I hope I'll see you in the signing line. Thank you so much for having me in this lovely community. It's a deep pleasure. Thank you.